now we are talking about uh, Satyagraha, uh, the most important uh, topic on Gandhian ethics. That well, uh, important in the sense because this was the uh, means of uh, uh, engagement with the real world uh, that Gandhi developed, uh, sticking on to his ethical ideals. It is easy. It is one thing, and it is easy to enumerate. Uh, ethical ideals, and it is another to implement it. In fact, uh, criticism various ethicists or religions or uh, moral codes always face is that they have uh, uh, prescribed uh, a code of conduct, but how to uh, uh, implement it, or how to put it into action, or how to make it engage with the world out there requires uh, uh, a kind of uh, is, is the test of the uh, theory and the theoretician. So, when we talk about uh, Satyagraha, we talk about uh, Gandhi's uh, ethical ideals meeting uh, the real world out there. Now, uh, what do we do when uh, uh, a, per a person uh, conflicts or a uh, and if a, a human predicament, if I may so put it, people differ in their opinions, and uh, uh, because they differ in their opinions, they have a, a, a conflict about it. Now, some of us uh, or one party in the conflict would perhaps uh, uh, accuse the other of being unjust. So we have conflicts about justice. Whether justice is uh, um, prevails or not, uh, how do we arrive at it? Uh, how do we arrive at the solution of a conflict? Now, if you take a look at the slide, we talk about conflict. How does can a moral person engage with injustice? Now, here, yes, we talk about uh, conflicts, but we talk about conflicts in with for the ease of understanding from a particular perspective, where we seem to be. Uh, where, where we take the perspective of a moral person trying to engage with injustice. So, what are the prevalent methods of engaging with uh, injustice? A is uh, rational discussion and B is violence. Are these successful? Now, this is a question that uh, we need to ponder on that well, uh, it is very simplistically put uh, very simply put up here that well, it is either rational discussion or violence, which seem to be the only two ways of engaging with injustice. And that is how perhaps it is. How can a moral person engage with justice? The prevalent methods that we see here are rational discussion or violence. Are these successful? Well, let us look at it this way. How does uh, one engage uh, uh, with injustice? Say, there are various notions of injustice, to, uh, uh, say between a uh, uh, factory owner and a factory employee, uh, between a landlord and a, a tenant. Uh, forget about the power structures, it could be a conflict between friends, it could be a conflict between or a disagreement between um, family members, and one uh, seems to be accusing the other of being unjust. So, how does, how do you, or when we talk of uh, Satyagraha from uh, a person's perspective, or one perspective, is how does the moral man uh, wish to um, convince the um, uh, apparently unjust person? Well, one is the uh, entire edifice of uh, uh, human uh, justice as practiced currently today is through discussion, through means of rational discussion that well, our appeal to reason. The entire uh, uh, era of modernity focuses its basis on reason or rationality, that rationality or reason is objective, and by appealing to reason, we can resolve any discussion. Of course, when this fails, we always uh, uh, have violence to count upon. In fact, that is why entire nations have uh, armed forces, and policemen have uh, uh, batons and firearms in their uh, hands. So, violence as a final, mean of, uh, final means of uh, tackling justice. Now, let us see what uh, does Gandhi talk about this. Now, let us consider the first aspect, rational discussion. Well, this uh, is supposedly the most uh, more civilized method, and what 
exactly happens in a rational discussion for conflict resolution or for uh, dealing with an unjust opponent. Well, uh, what it requires is that first, it requires that both of them coming to the uh, discussion table, both the parties coming to the discussion table should uh, a accept the possibility that they are fallible and biased and thus an honest attempt to take the other's perspective. So, accepting the possibility that we are fallible and biased, thus an honest attempt to take the other's perspective. B. Rational discussion pl takes place between psychological beings with desires and the latter can contaminate the former. So, this is an uh, important uh, uh, assumption that um, should be understood by the uh, uh, proponent or by, by when we talk about rational discussion, that rational discussion takes place between psychological beings and that the latter can contaminate the former. Let us uh, briefly talk about this. Let us say we have uh, look at it uh, this way, uh, we have whole uh, 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 the entire judiciary in any country is set up for enforcing justice. And it is such a simple evident truth, uh, that it uh, no more strikes us as uh, uh, anything profound, that when we engage lawyers, a better lawyer can perhaps uh, uh, win a case. Uh, undeservingly and an inferior lawyer would lose a case, uh, even though uh, 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 truth be on that side or justice be on that side. Now, what does this mean? This means that well, rational discussion can be uh, uh, guided according to the motivation that we are all psychological beings that we have seen that rational discussion is in favor of the uh, uh, more articulate. So, uh, let us uh, note this down that well, rational discussion favors the articulate. And is against the non articulate. This I would like to term as a structural flaw. Now, this is something that Gandhi very much takes into account, that rational discussion takes place between psychological beings and with desires, and the desires can contaminate the rational discussion. So, let us think of a classic example, where uh, in the Indian scenario, a lesser educated uh, tribal uh, is coming to seek justice from a uh, urban or an establishing industry. Now, the entire and both of them seek uh, 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 redressal in the judiciary, but definitely it is the industrialist, who has better access to uh, articulate lawyers, to uh, advocate his uh, position and case much better than what. Um, uh, the tribal can do. So, if we talk about rational discussion, then rational discussion comes out to be privilege, uh, priv to be favoring the ones who are articulate and, and it is definitely against the one that is non articulate. So, Gandhi uh, being a lawyer himself, understands the importance of how uh, rationality itself can be guided or goaded into the direction, what where one really wants it to land. So, uh, thus Gandhi is uh, critical of rational discussion as conflict resolution methodology, because uh, rational discussion is desirable, yes in principle, but it is of limited value in practice. After rational discussion, let us go ahead to the next option that comes forth. The next option that comes forth is conflict resolution, uh, violence as conflict resolution. Sorry. Now, this leaves us with violence as a means of resolution. So, frequently used in human uh, history, that it is abnormality does not seem unusual. This disturbed Gandhi. Now, now if we see that well, throughout the human history, we have, uh, we have had uh, uh, violence as a very dominant means of uh, guiding history, or a very dominant me means of uh, uh, resolving conflicts. 
that it almost seems so usual about it, that its abnormality does not uh, seem unusual. That its abnormality does not seem unusual. This is what disturbs Gandhi. So, uh, violence has become so common in human history, that it does not seem disturbing at all. Nations raising armed forces, arming the police, all seem so usual. In fact, the absence of it would seem striking. Violence or potency of violence, potency for violence, seems so obvious, that the normative issues around violence are almost forgotten. The utility of violence drowns the normative questions of it, of its justification or rather more accurately, the lack of it. Now, what is uh, violence as conflict resolution? Well, let us uh, consider this, that well, we engage uh, in a rational discussion, and it falls off, and then we have uh, violence as the backup method to sort it out. And that is why countries and nations, the whole world, uh, nations of the whole world raise their own armed forces. That is why uh, policemen are uh, armed, or that they have given been given the legitimacy, uh, which is again a question that. Can the state really give the legitimacy to the uh, um, internal police uh, to uh, use violence against its uh, citizens? But that apart for the time being, that well, it is such a common place to find uh, armed forces and uh, uh, armed policemen, um, uh, all evidence or symbols of violence as means of conflict resolution or of uh, tackling uh, disobedient behavior. That it seems unusual or abnormal to conceive of a possibility uh, with the lack of uh, uh, violence. Now, look at the sensitivity of this man called, later to be called Mahatma Gandhi, that uh, he finds this notion of violence disturbing, something that we are so used to it today, or perhaps in all times, that, uh, that these, these evidences of uh, uh, violence do not hurt us, that or uh, do not uh, disturb us, more accurately. So, uh, we find that, well, uh, non-violence as, uh, or violence as, uh, uh, sorry, violence as uh, conflict resolution as a very uh, standard backup measure. But, violence or potency, if you look at the third point mentioned here, violence or potency for violence seems so obvious, that normative issues around violence are almost forgotten. Now, what are these normative issues? Is violence wrong? Now, perhaps the answer to this, most people would answer, would to this question would be, will be that, violence is inevitable. Now, is this the answer of the question posed? Well, what is the uh, normative answer of this question? So, this normative answer of the question has almost escaped us, because it has been taken as a standard measure to tackle injustice. Well, then let us uh, raise the question, what is wrong with violence? Well, first, surprisingly or uh, disturbingly, this question almost escapes us. Perhaps, we do not reflect through life, about uh, wondering that, well, what is wrong with violence? What is wrong with violence? Well, Gandhi has an answer to this, and Gandhi has thought through this, and the answer flows from his ethical claims. Well, why is violence wrong? And perhaps immediately, most of us would be short of words to answer this. Well, Gandhi puts a structured answer to this claim. Well, according to Gandhi, A or 1, Violence denies the ontological claim, that all human beings have souls, and that they are capable of understanding each other with empathy. Now, if I am uh, allowed to play the role of the uh, empathetic advocate to Gandhi's views, for today's audience, I shall uh, rather use the word self over here. That well, what is Gandhi meaning? Gandhi does not have a uh, religious uh, underpinning, as uh, we would be sceptical of it perhaps today. Well, what exactly is meant that, well, all human beings are equal. All human beings are equal in 
moral potency and therefore, dignity. So, the point that Gandhi is trying to make is that, well ontologically if all of us have souls or selves and these selves are capable of understanding each other with empathy. So, there is a, we are all morally potent to appreciate the other perspective and thereof offer dignity to the other. Now, this is Gandhi has been influenced by the Syadwad doctrine of Jainism, which claims that there are many perspectives to reality or uh, that uh, a conflict is a difference in perspective only. So, whenever we have uh, notice that Gandhi is not uh, advocating uh, relativism. Rather, Gandhi is claiming that well, relativism is because of the uh, difference in perspectives, not because not uh, the difference in or not because truth is uh, relative. So, truth is relative only via uh, uh, till we keep the perspective into. Um, account, take the perspective into account. So, two Gandhi makes a claim that uh, it is an influence from uh, that, uh, uh, this is an influence from Syadwad and it is uh, that a conflict is essentially a difference in perspective only. This greatly alters the way the understanding of conflict that well, violence and, and three finally, violence is to confuse one's perspective as the only perspective, failing to see the other's perspective and being open to revision. So, these are very commonsensically uh, simple yet profound observations that can be made from Gandhi's uh, ethical ideals that well, to be violent is to, uh, to seek a resolution and this resolution is uh, required only because one fails to see the perspective of the other, fails to see the perspective of others. So, being open to revision is very much required and is an uh, easier way of uh, or is, is a more moral right, easier and accurate way of doing away with violence. Now, what more about violence? Well, uh, uh, Gandhi goes ahead and says that well, violence coerces behavioral change, not a change of attitude. So, when we talk about uh, violence, it only forces. So, uh, an army that conquers another uh, nation has conquered it, but has not changed its attitude. And what Gandhi seeks is a change of heart, not a possession of uh, physical entity. Uh, if we could discuss further about Gandhi's uh, metaphysic, we could understand that well, Gandhi makes postulates the necessity of assuming a self or a soul force is because the body is, is the domain of violence, uh, but the soul or the soul force or the self or the attitude is not the domain of violence and we can contain the body, we can give pain to the body, but um, to bring a change of heart or as he calls heart and the famous dichotomy between head and heart. The change uh, the self requires a more non-violent peaceful intervention, what he talks about in uh, which is Satyagraha. So, further why is violence wrong? Because it violates the moral integrity of the vanquished. It forces them to act against their conviction. Well, with the moment the victor conquers the vanquished the vanquished are forced to act in the uh, manner that the victors want them to act. However, this acting is not uh, out of the, uh, their conviction, uh, but it is out of force or fear or coercion. So, for the uh, vanquished, we find that their confirmation is only physical. Not mental, as Gandhi would say spiritual and what perhaps many of us could understand as attitudinal. So, when we bring about a difference, that difference we can force them physically or when the victor forces the vanquished physically, but the 
aim of a resolution is to bring about a change from the inside. Next, we talk about a transformation of views may be slower, but is definitely more desirable. Of the more impatient of uh, the audience, they would already be poking with this question that well, it is fine that we can use Satyagraha or you, we can use uh, uh, patience or we can use uh, uh, avoid the use of violence, but this is going to take a lot of time. It is simply easier to punish the errant citizen uh, by the stick of the policeman rather than to argue, convince with him or tolerate his uh, uh, indiscipline for him to learn. Well, accepted that uh, transformation of views is slower, but what Gandhi argues is that it is definitely more desirable, because it is long lasting, which comes out in the next issue that we talk about. Next point or bullet we talk is that results of the violence uh, of violence hardly last, whereas non violent resolutions last longer. And finally, violence breeds violence, it is a quick fix that works and incites repetitions as a conflict uh, solution. So, violence breeds violence. So, once we see that well a uh, system of uh, uh, say public lashing is working. So, we the administration or the leadership is uh, keen on using it again and again and, but to have the same effect perhaps it has to increase its dosage. So, uh, the next bullet talks about it. Well, the dosage of violence increases to attain the same effect. So, we have to increase the dosage of violence to increase to attain the same effect. So, any uh, punishments may have to be escalated to have uh, the same effect. It is almost like the case of antibiotics that well, uh, we use it as an uh, last measure, but indiscriminate use of it reduces susceptibility to uh, reduces its effectiveness and increases susceptibility to it. So, therefore, we keep have to increase the dose. That was a simplistic analogy, but for uh, the moment it can be seen to uh, make some sense. Well, and means and ends. This is what many times we see that Gandhi has talked about, uh, that means and ends. Uh, when we talk about means and ends, that Gandhi's philosophy is always about uh, the importance of means and ends. When we uh, uh, talk about that, we require uh, uh, any act is towards a goal, but is the goal separate from the uh, entire process uh, followed to achieve the goal. Now, for those who have a very clear distinction between means and ends, especially uh, considering its importance. This of course, is not a chronological classification, but this is a uh, uh, moral classification. So, when I am saying that well, uh, uh, Robin Hood uh, is stealing to dist, uh, distribute amongst the poor. Uh, the consequence may be well, uh, the hungry are fed, but the means can that is that to be included into the uh, action to be judged uh, to, to arrive at its moral potential. According to Gandhi, yes, that means if you look at the slide, means is not separate from the end, but a constituent of it. Peace after violence is still violence. So, when Robin Hood feeds uh, the hungry, he is still not uh, a morally appreciable act, because the food has been uh, stolen. The next issue that uh, Gandhi talks is uh, that comes out in the Gandhian ethics uh, ethical model, is that the method for of fighting for an objective was not external to, but an integral part of it. So, the method of fighting for an objective uh, is not external to, but an integral part of it. So, no matter what weapons you use, be the weapons that are used or the methodology that is used is not external to the objective, it is a part of it. In uh, uh, as, as uh, put forth in uh, Anthony Parrell's book, a non-violent revolution is not a programmed seizure of power, it is a program of transformation of relationships ending in a peaceful transfer of power take a moment to reflect over it. Well, enter Satyagraha now.
what this is where uh, seeing the futility uh, limitations and downright moral wrongness of the two means of conflict resolutions, Gandhi arrives at the Satyagraha. Satyagraha is about the appeal to the goodness in the opponent, with a strong underlying assumption that goodness is prevalent in all and that all are fallible, that one is fallible, that each one of us is fallible. Coming to the fourth uh, issue, about, fourth point about Satyagraha, Satyagraha is about being open to revision, open to compromise. Uh, it is of an ability to take the perspective of the opponent. Compromise is not negotiation, rather openness. So, many of us would understood, uh, would understand uh, compromise as negotiating without uh, a moral denominator. But for Gandhi, compromise is not such kind of a negotiation, rather it is openness, to see that one's perspective is perhaps inaccurate and therefore, it needs to be revised. As they say, evil can be killed with good, even the wickedest person is capable of feeling for the other. Only this faculty lies under, under used, Satyagraha only aims to awaken this. So, when we talk about uh, selfish person or a wicked person, he is a wicked person, because his love for others is much lesser. Nevertheless, even let us take the example of uh, Hitler, as Gandhi has uh, talked also about Hitler and his cruelty. Well, Hitler loved his uh, dog. So, the, uh, Hitler loved his mistress. So, there is a possibility of love even in Hitler, only it was confined to very few. The whole point of Satyagraha is to incite this potency into oh, uh, spreading into decision making. So, for Satyagraha, patience and love are the weapons of uh, Satyagraha. So, when we talk about uh, uh, Satyagraha, what is the methodology, methodology of Satyagraha? It is patience and love. The Satyagrahi waits patiently showering trust on the opponent and silently suffering offences only in the hope of making the opponent realize their folly. Now, uh, so briefly put, what mean by Satyagra is that, well, uh, it, it is a tools of conflict resolution of fighting injustice, a non-violent tool and no, it does not, uh, is not confined to rationality or rational discussion only. It is uh, incorporates the human uh, motivation for action. So, when human beings or when one person patiently waits, suffering injustice uh, in the aim of uh, sparking out the goodness or uh, good uh, uh, sense of judgment in the, in, the, in the opponent, that is when Satyagraha uh, is successful. That is the objective of Satyagraha. We can find various examples of Satyagraha. Uh, and, uh, uh, from a simple fact that when you see, um, uh, say, say you you uh, land uh, land up in a, in a uh, heavily crowded, uh, hot, damp uh, uh, counter selling tickets, and you find uh, that the uh, person who is selling tickets is uh, not uh, has uh, mistakenly or has intentionally uh, sold uh, the ticket to somebody behind you uh, in the queue. Now, either you can fight over there and ask, uh, cite it as a case of injustice, but the Gandhian or the Satyagrahi way would be to patiently smile and to make the uh, uh, clerk feel that he has done a mistake by uh, jumping the queue or disregarding the queue. And that is the objective of Satyagraha. So, when one makes a mistake and uh, the other attacks or accuses, it puts the uh, doer in a defensive. He tries to bring about justifications, and that is what uh, Gandhi always uh, cautioned us about, the misuse of rational justifications. So, he always brings about justifications to justify that uh, 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 lapse. But, if one is patient, and one is loving, and uh, uh, one can wait for uh, reform in the other, well, it brings about uh, change. And uh, so, uh, Satyagraha is all about patience and love for the other, and with the eternal undying hope, that uh, uh, 
uh, moral potency that all of us, all human beings are equipped with moral potency. It is only a matter of time and patience with which one can spark it off in the other. Well, but finally, there are limits to the patience of the Satyagrahi and let us keep in mind that Gandhi dealt with a lot of uh, this Satyagraha was not some mere theoretical speculation in a textbook academic institution. It was a means of struggle of the Indian independence movement. So, Gandhi has suggested that well, ordinary people or people will lose out on patience and the Satyagraha cannot be infinitely patient. So, Gandhi had devised other means for such situations, other means like economic boycott, civil disobedience, non-cooperation and various other, constitu uh, which constituted the armory for the non-violent wa warfare that uh, Gandhi talked about and practiced against the British with success. So, when one does not cooperate or when one does not, uh, uh, one boycotts the other, that is also a sense of moral pressure, what can be termed as moral pressure. Well, the limits of Satyagraha. Now, before we uh, you read the bullets on the limits of Satyagraha, well first I would say that many of us listening to this would be skeptical, cynical about the possibility of uh, uh, about the possibility of Satyagraha as a uh, means of struggle. It perhaps assumes too much or it expects too much from uh, human beings, uh, not to seek revenge, not to seek uh, uh, justice by uh, any means, rather wait for the other to realize uh, his or her mistake. But, uh, let us slow down and look at it, that well, here is was one man, who has actually used this uh, methodology in uh, India's freedom struggle with phenomenal success. And, he could make sure that, uh, crowds of people uh, um, give in to armed policemen, uh, lati charging them. So, I think uh, uh, this uh, instrument of uh, non-violent uh, warfare, uh, has of course, been uh, uh, demonstrated in, uh, in, in, in action in history, but it is also prevalently used today, in the way we discuss, in the way we talk uh, or deal with people around us. How many times, many of us are Satyagrahis, many of us uh, do wait for the other, to realize his or her mistake. And in this period of wait, we do suffer. Some are patient, some are less patient, some are very, uh, uh, um, very patient. Uh, just as say, uh, a father would uh, or a parent would be uh, patient towards uh, the erring uh, or uh, child, with the hope that well, the child would realize it is uh, his or her own mistake and uh, better. So, uh, but however, let us now come back and look at the limitations of Satyagraha. Now, today, this notion may seem like a fairy tale, but it was a vital practice in the freedom movement of India, as we talked about. Satyagraha assumes the goodness and civility of the opponent, for Satyagraha did not seem a potent possibility in the Hitler ruled Germany. Thousands of Jews, which were almost in human skeletons and uh, taken to uh, concentration camps, did not provoke the goodness or did not invoke any goodness or civility uh, in the oppressing German army. So, Satyagraha assumes, that there is goodness and civility of the opponent. Uh, Non-cooperation assumes an interdependence between the two parties. If the opponent can continue to function in isolation of the other party, non-cooperation may be far less effective. Well, Gandhi talked about economic boycott and uh, non-cooperation. Now, here we need to take the local, because to understand uh, uh, any uh, concept, we need to take its context into, uh, factor in its context. Uh, well, the goodness and civility, well many have argued that, Gandhi was possible, because the British uh, were the colonizing power, because of the inherent sense of uh, uh, practicing justice uh, in the British. 
uh, non cooperation was successful, uh, because the Britishers uh, uh, used Indians in the colonized India to run the country. So, a non cooperation by uh, the native Indians did uh, bring their uh, administrative apparatus to a standstill. So, non cooperation was successful, economic boycott was successful, because uh, the Indians were a uh, essential part to uh, the functioning of the British in India. So, uh, the context also lends meaning and this is not a uh, 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 formula or a claim that uh, uh, he Gandhi would say that it is unequivocally applied cutting across the local or circumstantial conditions, circumstances. Well, Satyagraha was possible only, uh, 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 so was possible at a time in world history. Was it the moral high ground of civilization or the power of Gandhi? The answer to this question will infer the possibility of the resurrection of Satyagraha. So, I leave this question with you that well, uh, to all of us or, uh, or to most of us perhaps, or to many of us, who have been sceptical and cynical of this extreme Gandhian notion. Well, for one, Gandhi did exist in flesh and blood, and he did uh, use Satyagraha as a means of uh, freedom struggle. So, we have a concrete example of how uh, uh, Satyagraha was used as an uh, non-violent means. And I leave this question to you with now, now that whether Satyagraha was possible, uh, because of the moral high ground of those times, or was it possible, because of the insistence and the uh, aura, or the magic, or the power of Gandhi. If it was possi possible, uh, uh, um, uh, for, for uh, because of a moral high ground of a particular time, Perhaps, my answer would be that, uh, no, it was possible then, if it was possible then, it would be possible now, it would is still in practice and it would still be possible in uh, future, uh, only it needs to be uh, summoned or by a force like Gandhi. So, I leave this question to you to uh, an open ended question to uh, explore the possibility of Satyagraha in uh, your life or in the current scenario. With this, we end the notion, we end our uh, uh, exploration of the Gandhian uh, ethics.